We got ACC preseason teams right here. Who from the Tar Heels, the Cavaliers, the Duke Blue Devils will find themselves at the top of the charts? Who has some work to do and all that in between? But what do preseason lists truly mean until you get on the field? We'll talk about what it means to us here on today's show. You are Locked On ACC, your daily podcast on the Atlantic Coast Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, on, everybody. Welcome to today's edition of Locked On ACC. I'm your host, Candace Cooper, joined by Kenton Gibbs of Locked On Wolfpack. Each and every day, you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you download, subscribe to the YouTube channel, as well as the audio space, all of the goodness that comes with listening to us, as well as seeing our lovely faces. It is Memorial Day weekend, so we want to take a moment, of course, to recognize all those who have sacrificed their life for us. We really appreciate you for your service. And more than that, we are celebrating time with friends and family and doing it safely as well as we hope that you did. Joining us here to talk, Kenton is going to help us through the Athlon Sports ACC 2023 all-conference preseason team and we're going to talk about the first team today both offense and defense and see how that tracks throughout the show. Kenton, how are you feeling? Uh, I feel great as always. I'm ready to get into it. Uh, I've talked about these lists already on Locked on Wolfpack a little bit from the NC State perspective but I'm ready to get into it from all of the ACC teams who was underrepresented, who was a little overrepresented, all that good stuff. Uh, let's get into it. No doubt. So we'll talk through the first team, as most of you probably have seen the articles come out and seen who is on the roster for preseason accolades. Again, from Athlon Sports quarterback Drake May leads the charge from North Carolina, coming off a record-breaking freshman year, following behind Sam Howell and doing it well. Now the questions will be, can he keep the momentum going now that, you know, some of the teams around, everyone around the league has some film on him, can understand his offensive line, a couple of shifts going on from that end will he be the same drake may is he overhyped a lot of people are bought in and sold on him some are still remaining to be seen of what he can truly be questions are out there but that's why they play the game absolutely i i think that this is a young man who um is a phenomenal talent and when he was rolling when he looked great he looked when he was rolling and, and at a high clip he he looked amazing he looked like you could not name five quarterbacks that were better than him um in terms of nationally through the air, on the ground. He did it all for that UNC team last year. And so I don't think that anybody was surprised by seeing him uh, be named first team all ACC preseason. This is the beginning of many awards for him. I'm pretty sure he's going to be the ACC um, preseason offensive player of the year, ACC preseason player of the year, and almost everybody's uh, rankings and whatnot. Maybe there will be a couple that go with Jared Verse, but we'll see. Over 4,000 yards on the year. He had 38 touchdowns, only seven interceptions. And a lot of people are saying, you know, he is the second coming on the Heisman track, competing very closely with guys like Jordan Travis. Last year, you had uh, my guy out of NC State who was supposed to be preseason All-American. All that came with the pressure in Devin Leary. Can Drake May settle not buy into much of the hype and uh, let it affect his game. Cause I think we saw a, a little bit of mental effect ineffectiveness from Devin last season. I mean, I think that Devin was fine except for getting hurt. Like that's, you know, when you're on a stretcher or when you're, when your shoulder is like this for a majority of the season, I don't think that there's much you can do. Um, but I will tell I mean, you. He this. wasn't. He wasn't as productive. Like it's okay. That 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 also is true. He wasn't the same. He wasn't the same guy. Tim Beck is to being an offensive coordinator. Um, what you know, Miles is to rapping. If you don't know what you who you know, Miles is, go Google him. It'll be fun. It, particularly a song called Benjamin Button. I'm sure you'll have a great time with it. Now, with that being said, sure, he was not all that productive uh, last year before he got hurt, um, but. I mean, that, the reality is that's what these preseason rankings are. They are people predicting what you're going to be. But in reality, a lot of times it can be a setup for failure. Um, and looking at and looking at Drake May and saying, hey, will he come out next year and have a great season? Most likely, I think he will. It, it, it tracks that he will. It makes sense that he should. Would I be uber surprised if he doesn't? Um, 
I would say depending on how bad and what happens, maybe. But, I mean, realistically, it wouldn't be the most shocking fall from grace we've ever seen. So do you think he's going to fall from grace? Yes or no? Uh, I think he'll do well enough to win ACC Offensive Player of the Year. I don't, I don't think that there will be anybody who's better than him. I don't, I don't think there will be a fall from grace, but I don't also don't think that he'll quite replicate what he did last year. I think it'll depend on how the team does. We all know that a lot of times some of these awards are based on team performance and not necessarily individual accolades. And, you know, of course, with the quarterback, if you have a really strong team and you get W's at the end of the day, that's certainly going to help you with Florida State's nod in terms of how high people are on them this season. I think Jordan Travis is probably the front runner off as the player of the year, but I can certainly see where you make the case for Drake May. Yeah, I mean, so here's the thing. Jordan Travis has much better weapons around him than Drake May at this point, right? You have two outstanding running backs in the backfield. You have objectively the largest receiver in the ACC that probably runs four or five or faster than Johnny Wilson. I mean, you you have a lot more that, and a lot of people say quarterback is the most important position in football, but I like to say it's the most dependent position in football because there's no other position that depends on as many people doing their job right for them to do theirs. Uh, so, the reality is when I say if Drake doesn't have a great year, it wouldn't be all that surprising. If I'm if, if correct me if I'm wrong, Kiara, are both of his top receivers from last year not gone in the NFL? I mean, Josh Downs is gone, Antoine Green is gone, yes. Okay, so both of those two are gone. Um, an offensive line that we saw last year that didn't look all that good against really against defenses that were that could hold their water last year. I mean I, I wouldn't it wouldn't be the most surprising thing in the world to see a statistical drop off and to see a guy who has better weapons around him uh, winning the, the offensive player of the year or having a better season. With that being said, if Drake May comes out and does what he did last year, this year, again, every knee must bow and tongue must confess that that man is the best. You cannot have any argument about is he how good is he or is he not when he goes out there with basically a sentient Roomba and, and in the backfield and 10 other players and makes it happen uh, in, in terms of having a dominant season again. That's just the reality there. Sure. And we're speaking of Jordan Travis having a lot of weapons. It would be remiss if we don't talk about the fact that his weapons are pretty much all over this all conference first team here. Trey Benson is running mm -hmm. back. Jaheim Bell made the all-purpose back for Florida State, or excuse me, all-purpose. Then you have Johnny Wilson, the guy who is arguably going to be in a top 25, certainly top 15 draft pick, if it was my opinion. Keon Coleman, who transferred from – I don't know where he transferred from. He is a transfer. Then you have Robert Scott, Scott off of that O-line. So talk about weapons Jordan Travis has many in his arsenal. Will he be able to help? I think they help elevate his game, and I think it just speaks to how high folks are on the Seminoles this season. Keon Coleman dominated. Well, I wouldn't say dominated, but Keon Coleman looked very good at Michigan State last year. Like, there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This is a, a very long receiver that I don't know how much more height and, and ability Florida State needs on the outside, but, you know, when you got Johnny on one side, and 6'4", 210 on the other side, um, you'll be all right. You'll, you'll, you'll be just fine in terms of those 50-50 balls, in terms of wanting to push the ball downfield, in terms of if you have a great running game, you can counter that with deep shots. You've got two guys that can get downfield in a hurry, and you got two guys that can get downfield in a hurry and go win that jump ball over a defender's head. So um, these this Florida State team is all over this uh, first team all preseason, all ACC team. And, you know, they are, I'm, and some people are going to get mad when I say this, a similar ilk to Miami in that they're always going to have players. They're always going to have ball players. Can you make it mesh together? Can you make it work together? Last year, it looked like that was the start of them making it mesh and work together. There were times where they looked darn good, upsetting LSU and things like that. And then there were times where it's like, did you just lose to Jack Chambers? They didn't complete a pass. NC State didn't complete a pass against them in the second half for game yardage, and they still lost that game. So there's there's times where, you know, even last year, Florida State, the talent showed. They looked amazing. They looked phenomenal. I want to say their last four or five games were darn near all blowouts uh, in the regular season. And so the question is, can they string it together and justify all of these first-team nods? 
hundred percent. I think they'll have to be rolling at a high consistent clip if they want to make some noise. Let's pay some bills here. If you're looking for a delicious snack, but don't want all of the sugar and calories and you need to the best tasting protein bar. And that is built bar. They are healthy and they taste amazing and they are covered in a hundred percent real dark chocolate. That's what makes built bars so good. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and cookies and cream. Great snacks on the go for your packing and traveling during this fun summer. I'm not sure how built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while in maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better is that they are healthy. Only 130 calories and four grams of sugar, the whopping 17 grams of protein. Go to your local Walmart or Sam's Club. You can still get that specialty flavor at built.com. So make sure you check that out. You can also get some built puffs. They are all there for you. So make sure you check it out, built.com, Sam's, or Walmart, and get your built bar today. Rocket and rolling with Kenton Gibbs going over the first team offensive, first team offense for Athon Sports ACC, all preseason lists, all the names, all the things, all the accolades. Okay. So we talked a lot, you know, this past week about some of these rankings and where teams lie. And of course, we talked about some of the bottom tier programs and talked about some of the top dogs. And Florida State is certainly one of the top dogs, but Clemson certainly is right behind them. And they will hopefully have Will Shipley at full health. He has some little spring setbacks in terms of just wanting to make sure that he was primed and ready to go. But he is going to be some certainly someone that everyone is calling upon to lead the top. Tigers along with Kid Club. Yeah, for sure. And, and when I look at Will Shipley, I say to myself, I get it. I see the vision. I just don't get if I quite see the level of hype that he's getting to an extent. Like, I, I, I like him. I think he's a really good player. I don't think that he is quite to the level that everybody, like, says he's at. I just, when I watch the tape, he does a lot of things well. He does a lot of things well. He doesn't do things to a level where I'm like, hey, he's one of those ones that the eye test does not fail me. He's one of those ones that shows up, does it day in, day out. He's good. He's good. But first team, not good. Mm, That's tough for me. Sure. And I think it's also we've been, you know, privileged to have Sean Tucker's Izzy's of the world. And we've had, you know, just some really good pass pass Javante Williams, Mike Carter's of the world, and now formerly Demi Sumo and those type of guys. And I think it's we've been spoiled with some really good running backs and Travis Etienne, of course, out of Clemson. And now, you know, Will is taking on a lot of that brunt and load for the Tigers. And especially because, you know, we don't know what we're getting in a full season of Cade Club. Nick, is he gonna have to lean on him? If he stays healthy, can he carry the load? I think that's something that certainly people will question. But if he's not available, that'll be even more challenging for that Clemson offense. Yeah, and and let me say this. One of the things I also want to add in is, yes, the eye test is kind of tough to gauge Will Shipley on because at times their offense was such a struggle to push the ball downfield that teams knew if we stack the box and say, hey, beat us on the outside, we dare you, they were going to struggle to do so, right? The the struggles of DJ, the struggles of the offensive line, made it tougher on him. So let me not be too harsh on the young man and say uh, that, you know, and give anybody the impression that I think that this is a bad player. Again, very, very good player. But this team is is going to go as far as he and K take them. That's just the reality. That defense, we know what they're about. We know what they're about. Just, uh, just a nasty group of individuals. Just a bunch of freak athletes that play the game the right way. They know where they're supposed to be. They're always in the right spot, especially in that front seven or front, you know, front six, seven, wherever you want to count it. They're always where they're supposed to be, but it's not going to be about the defense. It's going to be about Cade and Will. What can y'all do? How far can y'all take this team? A hundred percent. Talking through some of our middle of the pack teams, we saw Wake Forest. This is Jamal Banks hit this list after Donovan Green, after A.T. Perry. You know, you have yourself a nice wide receiver who is ready to help Mr. Um, what is his name? Mitch Griffiths. Mitch Griffiths. Yeah. Yes. Mitch, as we carry through the season for the Wake Forest offense, Jamal is 6'4", 208 pounds, and he certainly is someone who is not high on the charts, but if you give the eye test, you know that he has something special. I mean, this is another one of those guys that he – when you look at these Wake Forest receivers, you just wonder how many 6'4 guys that can run can they try out? How many? 
how many guys can they trot out of the exact same build, of the exact same mode of, hey, they can get down the field in a hurry, but not only can they do that, they can high point the ball like nobody else. Not only can they do that, they can break a tackle and make something special happen in space. You ask yourself, how many guys can they do that with? And every year, it just seems like there's another one, right? And if you talk about Jamal Banks and, and his ability to uh, make those 50-50 balls his, particularly in the red zone, is where he is where he specializes. I mean, a young man didn't catch nine touchdowns for no reason last year. So um, he's, a, he's a special guy, and he's going to be a – um, pressure release valve for Mitch plenty of times next in this upcoming season. I'm expecting for there to be plenty of times where it's like, hey, screw it. Jamal's down there somewhere. Let's chuck the thing to him and see what happens. 100% agree. Another one who will be chucking the ball to will be Gary Schrader to Orande Gadsden, the second out of Syracuse. He is certainly one that's been high on a lot of our lists. He has been, he has helped keep Syracuse in games, battle back, and remember the Purdue game being one especially. But I think that Aronde certainly has all in front of him to be successful. It's just a matter of can Syracuse sort of match that energy. The the question for Aronde, guys, literally the only question about this young man is, is he actually a tight end or a wide receiver? <laughs> because he can do it all. He is, and he's built a lot like the receivers that we just mentioned in terms of all of these guys from Wake Forest that are 6'4", 6'5", they can run, they can jump. He's, he's in that same mode. The only difference is he plays on the inside. He plays on the slot. At times, he's closer to the line of scrimmage, but it's not often that he's attached to the line of scrimmage, lined up in the traditional Y as opposed to an H-back, even if he is in a tight end-ish role. Uh, but, I mean, hey, he's another one of those ones. He is a guy that is a matchup nightmare. And like I talked about with the Wake Forest receivers, they're the outside guys, and so that's what they do. He is a safety destroyer. You put a linebacker on them, they can't keep up. You put a safety on them, they're not big enough. You you name it. Aronde Gaston II is going to find a way to get that ball in his hands. This is a very deserved first-team nod. Receiver, tight end, slot, don't matter. Put him on the field, he's going to make it happen. But it's confusing a little bit to me because why is Johnny Wilson a wide receiver and Aronde is a tight end? Because Johnny predominantly plays on the outside. Johnny is in the slot. If you look at the percentage of the time that they line up in the slot slash, again, in that H-back kind of attached to the line of scrimmage, but you're, you're not actually attached to the line. You're you're in more of a rock back position. Uh, for those of you who don't know, rock back is when the tight end is about one step behind the offensive line, either directly outside the tackle or in the B gap between the tackle and the guard. Aronde lined up there a lot more than Johnny did. So it that's that's probably the thinking there. But you are right in that uh, Aronde is part of the new era of tight ends, that Jimmy Graham breed of tight end, right? When Jimmy Graham was rolling with the Saints and, and all the great things he was doing, how often did you see him getting a three-point stance and block somebody? Very rare. But he was still listed as a tight end. And when he tried to get his franchise tag as that of a wide receiver, the NFL denied it for a reason. So I get it. I get why Rondé is listed as a tight end as opposed to a wide receiver. Um, but, yeah, he's, like I said, tight end, wide receiver, H-back, call him whatever you want. Call him whatever you want. Slot, call him what you want, but don't call him for fronts. He's a guy that's going to get you in the end zone one way or the other. A thousand percent. Moving through some of these stats here that we have for the first team offensive uh, unit. Not only do you have Aronde Gradson, who is certainly someone to be keeping your eyes on, but Ollie Jennings, the third from Virginia Tech, certainly someone I think that will have a breakout season, will need to have a breakout season for the Hokies because there's not a lot of bright spots, but yet, you know, if you can make a first team, certainly has people looking your way. You know, Ali Dennis the third is a guy that a lot of people, if you don't know anything about him, you're saying to yourself, how does he end up on this first team uh, squad? This is a guy who is transferring in from ODU. Mm -hmm. And you ask yourself, does the ACC just not have good receivers? Because how did two guys that are transferring in from school, from other schools, one of which not even being a power five end up on this list. However, Ali Jennings has shown he can do it at a high level, right? When ODU upset, I believe they upset Virginia Tech last year, correct? 
Don't get me to lie. It's been, it was one of the years, last they, two years. I know they upset a team in the ACC recently, and either way you put it, um, Ali Jennings was a part of that. Ali Jennings was a starter at um, – at, he was a starter – at ODU mm-hmm. for the last two years, caught for a thousand balls and I mean, caught for a thousand yards in both of those seasons, or rather, caught for a thousand yards in his junior season, 959 last season. But either way you put it, this is a young man that makes it happen as well. I get it. He's a guy that can run, he's a guy that has a lot of ability with the ball in his hands after the catch. So I get it. I now he's the only one that I think mm, you being a first teamer. A little suspect. I'm. I'm a you little. You just say the weird. same thing about Shipley. What are you talking about? No, no. I mean, in terms of the receivers, he's the only one that I'm looking at. Where I'm like, mm, I don't know. If you've seen the meme of all the guys in the the military outfits, and then the, the guy in the clown suit with the guy, I wouldn't say he's in the clown suit. I wouldn't say he's in the clown suit, but I am looking at you a little suspect. You got some things to prove, young man. <laughs> certainly that and we look at the offensive line certainly something to keep your eye on because cert- these quarterbacks will will need protection brian hudson out of louisville christian mahogany from boston college graham barton from duke robert scott from florida state as mentioned and zion nelson from miami certainly guys that are going to be critical components especially when we talk about robert scott who will be helping in that Jordan Travis unit and Graham Barton, who will be helping on that Riley Leonard unit, Zion Nelson for Tyler Van Dyke, and of course, Trish, Christian Mahogany for Boston College, who, you know, for all intents and purposes, they they used to be a nice, strong offensive unit. Certainly saw some things go left for Boston College last year with Phil Dracovic, but Kurtz, hopefully they can right the ship. Let me tell you something. Of all the guys on this list, I think that Zion Nelson is going to be the most pivotal to his team's success. If he does not play like a first team all ACC guy next year, I don't see a world where this Florida State team is, I'm sorry, where this Miami team is uh, is having a good season. Mm-hmm. Like objectively, and I know everybody likes to talk about, well, it's easy to pick him because he's a left tackle. Well, not just because of that. He, to me, he is going to be as pivotal in terms of, the team will go in the direction you go as any of these guys, Yeah, as any of these guys. There is a lot of youth and a lot of turnover on that Miami team. You need a stabilizing force or you need stabilizing forces on that type of team. Yes, you're bringing back Tyler Van Dyke. Yes, you're bringing back his best friend, who's his wide receiver number one and all that. But you know what a quarterback needs to get the ball to wide receiver number one? Time. You know how that works out. They said he wants to push the ball more downfield and all that. You know who's going to be responsible for helping out with that? That big left tackle. So uh, Zion Nelson is the guy that I'm looking at out of all this group and saying, if it is to be, it is up to me, is what he needs to be telling himself every day because this Miami team manifesting a good season ain't going to happen without him being special. Absolutely. We're going to spend tomorrow talking about the defensive unit because we want to give them as much time as we can, as well as we did for the offense, but wouldn't want to not talk about the first team specialist. I shouldn't take too much of the time. Ben Sauls is a first team preseason list from Pittsburgh, Daniel Sparks from Virginia, Jalen Stinson from Duke and Tugger Holloway from Virginia Tech. I will say Daniel Sparks is an easy pick for Virginia because boy, did he have his work cut out for him for the Cavs. (laughs) <laughs> uh yes daniel sparks did get a good leg workout last year um but i want to talk about Jalen stinson for a second because he he was when i look at stinson and i talk about what makes him so special or, or what does he deserve to be a first teamer and why i'll say this without him that season last season would have been a lot harder for duke like that's just an objective fact there is no if, ands, or buts about that. There is no way around that. And what do I mean by this? This is a young man that has had to be uh, something special in terms of getting them in better field position than they would have been in uh, otherwise in the kick return game, which in turn makes your offense look better. It helps out your points per drive. It helps out your field position when you're uh, struggling offensively and all that, and you're playing that battle of attrition that you know whoever cracks first. A, a kick returner like him helps you out immensely and so um he was a big part of duke's success last year i expect nothing less from him this year 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that Jalen is certainly one who brought some excitement back to Wallace Wade. I mean, certainly got the team back in games, ran a couple back for, you know, touchdowns. So it'll be interesting to see how he matriculates even in this year. As we look through again, the defense will go over all of your first team names and then make sure that we just highlight some of the bright spots of people who were snubbed, certainly from the second teams and so on. But want to make sure that you guys know that we are in the summer season and that means we are three episodes a week. So you will catch us three times on YouTube. You will catch us three times on our audio spaces, Apple, Spotify, all the likes. So make sure that you stay abreast. We'll, of course, be use our Locked On ACC Twitter to remind you of when we're dropping episodes. But if you have some downtime this summer, there's a lot to catch up on. We have a whole playlist of some schedule releases for the ACC here. We've got you know some teams that we feel high about, some teams that we're a little bit head-scratching. If you want to get up to speed on the realignment stuff, we may have to have some special ep- episodes dropping as – June could get crazy. July could be even crazier. Kenton and I plan to attend the ACC kickoff where we'll get ready during the end of July. But for these months, June and July, we will have three episodes a week. So we want to make sure you guys are good to go there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Solid. So all that to say, housekeeping notes. We want to make sure that you guys keep rocking with us. Give us your feedback. Leave the comments. Respond to our polls and chats. Kenton does a great job of making sure that you guys have some good questions each and every day to respond to and vote for. So make sure you talk to us and how you feel about said things. But I think other than that, I should see us returning soon and talking about some defense if you think that'll be up for speed for you, Kenton. Absolutely. I'm ready to do it. All good. All right. For Candace Cooper and Kenton Gibbs, hope you guys have a great safe weekend. Until next time.